I'm seeing it written now, at least on the Bloomberg, that at some point it gets to be so big you have no choice that you have to be in it as a bracket manager. Is that true? I don't think so. I mean, look at the market cap compared to the market cap of, say, the equity market. I don't really know. Uh, our clients at Brown Brothers, real fund managers, real asset managers as opposed to the hedge fund community. I don't really see them buying bitcoins. I see them buying maybe some of the technology companies, the backbone behind it. But really buying bitcoins, I still don't see it. Uh, the bubble conversations was really interesting, and Aaron Brown wrote in Bloomberg View today. Uh, he he heads the financial market research over at AQR, and he says, "Look, prices do not display the long-term dynamics associated." with bubbles and I find that really interesting because he said if institutional money comes in and there's no dramatic price decrease or increase or volatility that's not a bubble if there's not a lot of institutional interest and there's not a lot of movement that's no bubble and he says we're not there yet I found that interesting but, but you do hear about institutional in some sense institutional interest in the fact that Goldman says they're open to it other people are saying they're taking a look at it at least and now you have the CME about to start trading options next month right will that really establish it more as legitimate well, I think this is part of the problem is that right now you can't really go short bitcoins. That futures contract at the CME will allow people to go short. I think this is a, uh, I think that what's happening is that there's a lot of cash, a lot of liquidity. It's lifting all risky assets, whether emerging markets, junk bonds. And I think bitcoins, and I don't even know why we call them coins, except that they call it coins in a name, sort of like uh, friends on Facebook. What does that really mean? And I think that this is just, I think that what happens is that uh, the, the liquidity in the system is lifting all asset prices. And when the liquidity gets drained, bitcoins or these cyber currencies will also be drained. But we did see a play a safe haven role in Zimbabwe last week, right? I mean, yeah. But what does that really mean? I mean, a safe haven from Zimbabwe. I mean, yes, the Zimbabwe currency imploded. Yes, the bitcoins went up. So did gold. Not as much though. So if you're going to look at safe havens, for example, you got dollar. Was the dollar? Maybe it's the euro, gold, bitcoin. Like, no, but well, the, how the would bitcoins you rank can't. It? The bitcoins can't absorb the kind of liquidity we're talking about. The foreign exchange market, five trillion dollars a day. How much is the bitcoin? But the Bitcoin has come so much farther, so much faster than anyone would have anticipated. So why do you rule out the possibility that it won't just keep going? Oh, I think it could keep going. I have no clue where price is, but I don't think that, as economists, we think that like, there's, we think we know the price of a lot of things, but don't know the value of anything. And I but, think that we don't know the value of Bitcoin. We know the price. But I'm asking about not just price, but also liquidity. I mean, as these exchanges develop and they start becoming interconnected and we start having futures traded and things like that, why do we rule out the possibility? We don't know what will happen, but that is the possibility that it actually does become more like, uh, like gold. It, it, it could be. I, I, just, I, I, I would doubt this. I think there's, there's no intrinsic value. There's no use value. And I think that it, it lacks the critical mass to be used as a, as a means of exchange. So it's really you hoard these things, and you look at how much energy it costs to produce these, how much computer power. It's very inefficient compared to even, like, say, a regular credit card.